Hello, Physics 30s. I hope that you are all doing well and that you're ready to start a new unit of study in physics dealing with magnetic forces and fields. Today will be an introduction to this unit where I talk about uh, what a magnet is and specifically what a permanent magnet is. We'll also draw magnetic field lines surrounding permanent magnets, look into the Earth's magnetic field, and then briefly describe the domain theory of magnetism, which can be used to explain uh, uh, the behavior of some of these uh, permanent magnets. Before I do jump into the lecture notes, though, I just wanted to identify the learning outcomes as identified by the Physics 30 program of studies. So today we would, one, describe magnetic interactions in terms of forces and fields, and two, compare gravitational, electric, and magnetic fields caused by permanent magnets and moving charges in terms of their sources and directions. I bolded permanent magnets because that's going to be our area of focus today. A good starting point would be to define what exactly a magnet is. I have said that a magnet is anything that is capable of producing a magnetic field and can be influenced by other magnetic fields. Now, this might be a good time just to very quickly talk about the other kinds of fields we've dealt with in both physics 20 and physics 30. In physics 20, we discuss gravitational fields. What a gravitational field is, or just a field in general, fields are just region of, regions of influence. A gravitational field is a region of influence that surrounds a mass. It's a region of influence that surrounds a mass, and that region of influence can influence other masses. So for example, the Earth has mass, it produces its own gravitational field. It can then influence other masses, for example, us, satellites, like anything basically in close proximity to like the Earth. Electric fields, which we dealt with in the last unit of study in physics theory, electric fields are regions of influence produced by charges or objects that have a charge to them. The region of influence produced by an electrical charge can influence other charges, which we know if you look at the law of charges, because like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So a magnetic field or a magnet uh, can produce a magnetic field. And then a magnet can also be influenced by magnetic fields from other objects. Now, there are two types of magnets that we're going to look at in this course. Uh, one, and this is where we start off with today, is permanent magnets. And then two, in the next lecture, we'll talk about what an electromagnet is. Permanent magnets, that's that Microsoft clip art picture you see of the horseshoe magnet there. It's probably like the... The, the, whenever I use, I say the word magnet, it's probably like the, the first like image that might come up with what a magnet would look like. That's what a permanent magnet is. We can also refer to them as bar magnets. Now, these magnets uh, consist of ferromagnetic substances. Now, when you see that word ferro, uh, you can probably make a guess as to like what kind of element a ferromagnetic substance might contain. If you go to the periodic table and you look up iron, iron has an element symbol of Fe. I think the Fe is an abbreviation for ferrous, which is like a, the Latin word, I believe, for, for iron. So if a substance has iron in it, then it is capable of producing a magnetic field. But there are some other elements as well. If a substance has either iron, nickel, cobalt, or some kind of alloy combination, an alloy is usually just a mixture of a bunch of different metals, then it can produce a magnetic field. Okay? And that would be classified as a ferromagnetic substances. And all the bar magnets that we look at, or the permanent magnets, would be ferromagnetic substances. 
the mini lab activity you completed in class prior to the start of this unit where station one, you had all those little tiny bar magnets around, those would all be classified as permanent magnets or ferromagnetic substances. Now, here's like a really simple diagram of a bar magnet on the bottom right hand corner of this slide. So I have a bar magnet and on this bar magnet around it, you can see a bunch of lines. Those are magnetic field lines. What field lines do is that they communicate two pieces of information to you. They communicate what direction the field is, and they also tell you how intense the field is based on how closely spaced together the actual field lines are. So if you look at the actual diagram here, presumably you're all familiar with like what a north and a south pole is. If you look at the region surrounding the poles, it's maybe like somewhere around here, then somewhere also close to this area. I can see in these areas that the field lines are very densely packed together. Perhaps one way of defining what a pole would be then is it would be a region where the magnetic field is the strongest. And the region where the magnetic field is the strongest would indicate that that's where the magnet would have the greatest influence on other magnets. And that's not surprising. If you took another bar magnet and you put like, for example, uh, its North Pole close to this South Pole, it would attract very, very quickly because the region of influence is very strong near that pole. Every magnet is bipolar and bipolar just means you have both a North Pole and you have a South Pole. One of the magnets you needed to look at inside of uh, the mini labs was this small cylindrical magnet, which kind of looks like this right here. It's got a really tiny cylinder. And it may not be clear on that magnet where the North and the South Pole are. If you exaggerated the height of the magnet a little bit, so let's make this like a really, really big cylinder instead of like the really short cylindrical magnet we have then perhaps you might be able to make a better guess as to where the North and South Pole are. I'm not going to give it away for you right now because that's something you need to figure out. Bar magnets are often referred to as magnetic dipoles. Magnetic dipole, uh, the, the prefix di also makes a reference to two of something. So it has two poles to it. But the bar magnet you can see there. Law of magnetism, very similar to how the law of charges works. If you have two like poles that are facing each other, so that could be like a North Pole facing a North Pole or a South Pole facing a South Pole, they're going to repel. If you have two opposite poles facing each other, so a North Pole facing a South Pole, then they would attract. Now, you can't treat poles the same as you would for electrical charges. And here's what I mean by this. So for example, let's say that you took a positive charge and you put it close to the South Pole. It's just at rest here. Do not think of the South Pole as being negative and the North Pole as being positive. They're not charged. Okay, so don't think of it like that. Because if you thought of it like that, then if, you're, if you put this positive charge near the South Pole, you'd expect it to attract. If you put a stationary charge in a region uh, that where there's a magnetic field, nothing will happen to it. Now, if the charge is moving, that's a different story. We'll talk about that in a later lesson. But a stationary electrical charge uh, will not be influenced by a magnet. So again, do not think of the North and South Pole of a magnet as being positive or negative. They're, they're distinct, they're different. Now, heavy emphasis in this lesson is going to be on constructing magnetic field lines surrounding permanent magnets. And just like with the electric field lines, we're gonna look at a few rules in terms of how we can construct these. When you draw magnetic field lines, they must emerge from the North Pole of a magnet and they have to go back into the South Pole. So that's my first rule. 
The second rule is that when you draw magnetic field lines, they have to form a closed loop. So think of like a race car track, wherever you start, you have to come back to that, that starting point at some point to form a loop that's closed. So right away, this is like quite a bit of a difference compared to gravitational and electric fields, which do not need to form closed loops. Third point, magnetic dipoles tend to align with the direction of an external magnetic field. That just means if you put a magnetic dipole, now part of that mini lab uh, involved sprinkling the iron filings around a bar magnet or a permanent magnet and then seeing what happened. And those little tiny uh, iron filings, those are all magnetic dipoles. Like they're really, really tiny magnets. They have a North Pole and a South Pole. And what they tend to do is they tend to line up with the direction of the magnetic field produced by your permanent magnet. First example here, we're going to look at four different uh, configurations of magnets and try to sketch the magnetic field lines. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance here because I'm going to attempt to sketch this using a uh, writing tablet, which is like really hard to do. But let's see how well I can actually like go ahead with this. So the way I like to do this is whenever I'm drawing magnetic field lines, I like to always start at the North Pole. So for part A, I'm going to start at the North Pole at this point where I have this uh, little tiny purple dot. Now, what a magnetic field line must do is it must come out of the North Pole and go into the South Pole. So one way I could draw this is I could have it come out of the North and then loop back into the South. And we can use a little directional arrow to indicate what direction the field is. Now that's not closed right now. So what I need to do is I need to make this go through the magnet to get my closed loop. Now I'm going to draw another one right here. So we'll start here and we're going to go out of the north. I'm going to make this guy go a bit further away. And then it's going to come back into the South Pole. By the way, th these lines should not touch. So I, I, I tried not to make them touch right here, but I believe they might make a little bit of contact. But just like with electric field lines, they should not touch or overlap. Okay, and then we go back through the magnet. Like this. Now, the reason I want to draw the second line here is because if you look at the spacing between the lines, if you compare the space from like the magnet to the first line compared to the spacing from the this line to the second one, you can see that the spacing is getting bigger. That just means the magnetic field is getting weaker the further you get away from the bar magnet. Now, when we draw these lines, we want to make them symmetrical. So I'm also going to do this below the magnet. So I'd start at the north and go out of the north. loop back around into the south and then we have to form a closed loop and then we'll do the uh, one more line so we'll go out of the north this time we'll make it go further away because we want to show with that increased line spacing that the magnetic field is weaker further away and then we go through the magnet to form a closed loop. So that would be my magnetic field line for uh, this first magnet. And if you sprinkle the iron filings along the uh, outside the magnet, they would line up with the direction of the magnetic field. So if I sprinkled one at the very top right here, then it would line up maybe so it looks like something like this here. Okay, it lines up nicely with the direction of the field. B, I'm going to close the ends of these magnets off. So let's make this a south pole. And we'll make this one a south pole. This is really just pretty much the same thing as like uh, part A, except you have two magnets. So once again, I'll start at the north pole here and I'll go out of the north. Back into the south. Here's my closed loop. Out of the north. This time, make it go further away just to 
communicate that the field is getting weaker the further away. Again, that line should not have overlapped there, so that's my bad. Uh, and then we'll do another one, make it symmetrical. So we go out of the north into the south, get this closed loop, start at the no north, go out of the north, back into the south, form a closed loop. It's going to be similar for this other magnet here. So we'd start at the north end and go out of the north, and then back into the south, form a closed loop, out of the north, go further away this time, to show the field's getting weaker, that increased spacing. Back in there. And let's make this symmetrical. Out of the north. Back into the south. Out of the north. Back into the south. And then the direction is on the outside pointing towards the right. So that would be my magnetic field uh, surrounding these two guys. Directly in the middle, at this point right here, the magnetic field would actually be just offset by the two magnets at that one point. Okay, C gets a bit more complicated. So first of all, let's close this magnet off. Let's make this a south pole. We'll make this one a north pole. All right, so I'm gonna start at the North Pole right here. Now, this one right here to start off with, one thing it could do is it could immediately just wrap back around the, the, the back of the magnet it starts with like this. You could go out of the North and then back into the South like that. And I could also do the same thing in the bottom here. I could go out of the north and just quickly wrap back into the south. Okay, that would be fine for like one of the lines, but we need to show some kind of interaction between these two magnets. Another thing that can happen right here is we can go back to the starting point for the, the north pole on this, this left-hand magnet. And we're going to draw a line that kind of like curves up a little bit and then goes into the south pole it bends a little bit now out of the north into the south we pass through this bar magnet now out of the north into the south so there's a couple of ways this can happen like one you could have it just loop back into this magnet right here. That doesn't give you a closed loop though, because we started at uh, the North Pole on the left magnet. And if we did that, like we're not returning to where we started from. So the only way we can return to where we started from is we need to have a bigger loop here. So what we can have is we can have out of the North and then go all the way to the back side of this magnet right here and then it can pass through that magnet and then you're back to where you started and then we'll make that magnetic field line point towards the left uh, let's do the same thing uh, just to make some symmetry here so if we start the north pole on the bottom of this magnet we then bend down and then we could go through the magnet we could close a loop by going out of the north back into its south pole. Again, that doesn't give you a nice completed loop. I mean, it would if you started at this north pole and just wanted to form one loop, but we want to do it, we want to show the interaction between both magnets. So this guy would then loop way around here. Come back into the south pole, pass through this magnet, and then you're back to where you started. I could do a couple more here if I wanted to. So I could start right here and I could go out of the north, 
into the south. As you get closer to the center of the magnets, the, the field starts to get a bit more uniform. So we start to see the lines pointing just towards the right. And then I could have this go through. And then to close the loop, I can go way around here. And now the spacing should get bigger because I want to show the fields getting weaker away. And I can come all the way back in. And then I get my nice closed loop lines towards the left on the outside. And I can do the same thing uh, for the bottom for symmetry. You can start here, go straight across. So out of the north into the south, pass through the magnet. Then again, we can loop all the way around. Probably gonna run out of space here. That should be increased spacing if I had enough room. And then we can go back through the magnet and then we're back to where we started. Okay. So it looks like kind of like a giant hamburger. If you want to look at it, like actually like give some kind of an analogy for like what the field lines look like here. Okay, D is a horseshoe magnet. So for this one, let's start at this point. I, again, I always like to start at the North Pole. So I'll go out of the North into the South. And then we need to form a closed loop. So the only way we can do that is we, if we go through the actual magnet, so we loop around and then come back here. And we can also go out of the north into the south. Again, we have to form a closed loop. The only way to do that is to go through the magnet. And then we'll do one more out of the north into the south. Again, form a closed loop through the magnet then back to where we started. Now, I just want to point out a couple things right here. So one, a good thing about a horseshoe magnet is in the region between the poles right here, the magnetic field is roughly uniform. So I'll say uniform field. Also, the magnetic field inside one of these bar magnets. So I'll just highlight this with a different color to show you like where else the field is approximately, uh, approximately uniform. So if I look at, sorry, let's pick a pen here. Okay, if I looked at this, oh, no, I want yellow. Okay. If I look at this, just the region that's like inside of the actual bar magnet. The region inside the bar magnet has approximately a uniform magnetic field as well. Okay, so that'd be another region for a uniform magnetic field. The other one is between these two bar magnets right here, the closer you get to the center of the magnet, the more uniform the field is going to be. And again, we like uniform fields in physics because then it gives us the ability to perform calculations. If the field's changing, then it gets really, really complicated where you need to start to deal with some calculus to properly account for like a changing magnetic field based on your position. Earth's magnetic field. So at first glance in this picture right here, uh, I wanted to clarify that uh, there is not a gigantic bar magnet inside of the Earth. This is just a model showing uh, how the Earth's magnetic field behaves. Now, you got to be a little bit careful right here in how we distinguish between a magnetic pole and a geographic pole. So on this picture right here at the very top, okay, that's the North geographic pole. So that's where... Santa Claus would be on the very bottom right here is the Southern geographic pole. And I'll just make the assumption that there's some penguins there. Now, when you look at the picture right here, uh, I can see that like I'm representing the earth's magnetic field as if there was this gigantic bar magnet that's inside of the, the earth inside of the earth. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about this right now because 
in the assignment you need to complete, there's a little section where you need to read about a few possible theories of how the Earth's magnetic field is produced. So for the time being, I'm, I'm simply going to state that there isn't, the Earth does produce a magnetic field. It does it somewhere in the core through some kind of unknown mechanism. And there's some different theories you're going to read about as to how exactly this happens. I believe in the uh, outer core, like layer of the Earth's crust. It's, it's made up of liquid iron and nickel. Again, iron and nickel being ferromagnetic material. So maybe that has something to do with the Earth's magnetic field, or maybe not. Again, you need to read the article to kind of get uh, a sense of like what a few different theories are about this. But let's pretend that this giant bar magnet is actually true. So the thing you got to be careful with is that the North Geographic Pole, so that's where Santa Claus is, is in fact a Southern Magnetic Pole. Now, the reason this is true is uh, the way we, we primarily, uh, like one tool we use that interacts with the Earth's magnetic field is a compass. Now, what a compass needle looks like, I mean, this, this, is, this is a horrible picture that I constructed using Microsoft Paint, but a compass needle presumably has some kind of point. Now, on a compass needle, the tip or the point of the compass needle has a north pole. Now, the way a compass needle works is if you're lost out in the wilderness or whatever, uh, your compass needle, if your compass is working properly, it's actually magnetized, uh, it will point towards the Earth's geographic north pole. It points towards where Santa is. Now, in order for it to point towards the northern geographic pole, it means it needs to be attracted to a south pole. So it turns out that the northern geographic pole is actually a southern magnetic pole. If I was right here, okay, and I actually like use my compass, my compass would point towards that southern magnetic pole. The north pole would be attracted to the south pole. It always points there. Now, on the other end of the Earth, where you have the penguins, your southern geographic pole would actually be a northern magnetic pole. So just make sure to make the distinguish, distinction between a geographic pole and a southern magnetic pole. And then also read about the different theories for why the Earth actually produces a magnetic field. The final thing we're going to discuss today is a theory called the domain theory of magnetism, which is going to explain the behavior of those permanent or bar magnets. What this theory states is that if you have a material that is ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic means that it's a material that has iron, nickel, cobalt, or some kind of metallic combination of like those elements I just listed. And it's made up of a bunch of tiny magnetic domains. These magnetic domains are somewhere that are about less than one micrometer in length. So what does this actually mean? Well, these little magnetic domains, they actually are a bunch of mini magnets. So you might be questioning, okay, so what exactly is a bar magnet made up of? It's made up of a bunch of little magnets. That seems to be like an absolutely absurd theory to state that uh, an object is just made up of smaller pieces of the exact same object. But it turns out that uh, this can actually be used to explain uh, the behavior of some of these permanent magnets as ridiculous as the theory actually does sound. Now, before I talk about a couple of these observations, I do just want to clarify uh, two different states. So one state is what it looks like for a bar magnet to be unmagnetized and one for it to be magnetized. Now, the picture you see right here, so this big rectangle on the outside, that would be your bar magnet. Or your permanent magnet. I don't know why we call them permanent magnets if they can get into an unmagnetized state, but let's not worry about that right now. 
So what I can see right here is my bar magnet is made up of a bunch of mini magnets. Now in the orientation you see here, this is a state where the magnet would be unmagnetized. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in an unmagnetized state, if you look at the orientation of the magnetic domains, it looks like they're scrambled all over the place. Like there's no real pattern in terms of how they're oriented. So in this state right here, your domains are just in a random orientation. Now, when they're in a random orientation, each of these little magnetic domains have produced their own magnetic field. Like for example, maybe this guy has a north pole right here. This one has a south pole. So your magnetic field will be out of the north into the south, out of the north into the south. Now, if they're in a state where they are randomly oriented, all of the individual magnetic fields, they, they kind of work against each other. And they work against each other to the point where the magnetic effects from each of these little domains, they just cancel each other off. So the net effect is that this permanent magnet would actually not behave like a magnet at all. And this can happen. If you've ever had like a magnet you put on a refrigerator and you keep it there for a very long period of time, eventually it seems like your magnet starts to slide down the fridge and it just doesn't stick as well as it used to. Well, that's because the domains within that magnet would be becoming more randomly oriented. Compare this to the magnetized state. What I can see right here is in the magnetized state, the domains are all nicely aligned. Now, if you had a magnet that was unmagnetized and you wanted to get it magnetized again, what you could do is you could put it in an external magnetic field, which that means just put this magnet into a, a magnetic field produced by some other kind of object. This could, for example, be like another bar magnet. You could have like a jumbo bar magnet here that has like a North Pole where my field lines come out of. And I could have another jumbo bar magnet right here where we have a South Pole. So the field lines go out of the North and they go into the South. Now, if I take this magnet and I put it through here, well, as these field lines pass through the magnet, they have to align so that my little rule, which states that field lines have to go out of the north into the south. So they would have to align so that this would be a south pole, this would be a north pole, because then my field line would go into the south, out of the north. And then just keep doing it over and over again. I'd go into the south, out of the north, until it passes all the way through. And eventually, all these magnetic domains would get aligned again. And when they're aligned, all the individual magnetic field contributions would work together. That's what I've stated here. When you take uh, an unmagnetized permanent magnet, again, I don't know why it's called the permanent magnet if you can unmagnetize it. Uh, let's just say bar magnet. If you take an unmagnetized bar magnet and you put it in an external magnetic field, the domains will align themselves with the magnetic field. So now it's back to being a magnet again. You could stick it back in your fridge and it would uh, stick to the fridge. This process here, where you can actually take a magnet from being unmagnetized back to the magnetized state, is what we call induced magnetization. I suppose in a sense, you could think of like inducing something as in like creating something. So in, in a way, you're kind of like creating magnetization. But I don't know if creating is the best word to use because uh, you're not making these magnets. The do domains are there. They just need to be realigned for that magnet to start behaving like a, a permanent or a bar magnet again. Now... Like I said, the domain theory seems absolutely absurd, but you can use it to explain a few important observations in terms of how the magnets behave. So one of them is you can use a domain theory to explain what happens if you have a bar magnet that's split in half. So let's say, for example, we have like a bar magnet with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight magnetic domains. Now, if you took that magnet and you just snapped it in half, let's use a different color here to represent this. So let's say we broke this magnet in half. What you'd end up having is you'd have one magnet that has four magnetic domains and the other piece has four magnetic domains. So if you take a bar magnet and you split it in half, what you do is you produce two separate magnets. Now, each of these magnets would have half the magnetic field strength of the original bar magnet. In fact, uh, the magnetic field strength of one of these pieces would be proportional to the number of magnetic domains that you would have. So for example, if I did a different type of split, I'll do this one with yellow. So let's say we did a split like this where I broke it. So one piece had six magnetic domains and the other piece had only two of them. Then this piece right here would have 75% of the original magnetic field strength. And then this broken piece right here, because it only has 25% of the original magnetic domains would have 25% of the original magnetic field strength. Two, how can a magnet get to the unmagnetized state, which means that the domains are unaligned? Well, one way to think about this is if you look at the domains, so let's go back here. So let's draw a few of them right here. Let's do like six this time. Think of these domains like particles that make up a substance. So one way the particles, I suppose, could get like more disoriented is if they start to move around a lot. Now, there's a couple of ways that you could you could make this happen. Uh, just ignore that part there. Uh, one, you could heat the magnet up. If you heat the magnet up, what that would do is that would increase the temperature and the temperature would increase the uh average speed of all the particles that make up the substance. So these individual domains that start to vibrate around a lot more, if they start to vibrate around a lot more, they're likely to come out of alignment and they become in the unaligned state. Another thing you could do is you could just take the magnet and you could just shake it repeatedly. Uh, that's what happens to your fridge. If you have a magnet on your fridge, the fridge does vibrate a little bit. So for a very long period of time, eventually the domains get unaligned. Or you could just take the magnet and just keep throwing it against the ground and you could cause the domains to unalign. But in that scenario, you're more likely to break the magnet before you actually uh, get it to the unmagnetized state. Three, what effect would impurities inside the aligned domains have? Okay, so let's go back and draw another picture of like the magnet. Now you can think of impurities as being like little chunks of material little chunks of material that are all throughout the uh, the actual magnet. So I'll draw one impurity here. It's like one impurity is kind of like lodged right here. Another impurity is lodged right there. Now, think of it like this. If you have these impurities, which are lodged between the domains and you started to shake the magnet, because the impurities lodge between the domains, the domains can't really move. They're kind of stuck in place. So in this case, the impurities would actually help in keeping the magnet magnetized. Now, on the other hand, if you're in the unmagnetized state, so the unmagnetized state would be, let's draw like a few like random domains here. And if you had an impurity in here, it 
Now, if you tried to induce magnetization, it would probably be really difficult because like to go from unaligned to aligned, well, again, the impurities are blocking like the actual uh, rotation of the domains. I suppose with like a really, really, really strong external magnetic field, you could get them to align. So ultimately what the, the, the impurities do is if you're magnetized, it makes it difficult to become unmagnetized. If you're unmagnetized, it makes it difficult to become magnetized. So basically the impurities make it difficult for whatever state you're in to change. Yeah, so they lock the domains in place. That's the conclusion of the lesson. And what you would need to do now is complete the assignment called permanent magnets. And as I said, towards the end of the assignment, you eventually are going to read about different theories as to how the earth produces uh, its magnetic field. And in the meantime, uh, I will talk to you later.